Yeah, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Eric, and maybe you can introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, so, my name is uh, Eric Asaba, and uh, I'm working at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, here, I'm an associate professor uh, and also uh, currently head of division of occupational therapy. Uh, and actually, today we're here at Stockholm Sjukhem, uh, and uh, here I have an affiliation as a guest researcher, uh, or affiliated researcher rather, uh, one uh, day a week. Uh, and uh, my uh, final affiliation is to Tokyo Metropolitan University uh, in Japan uh, as a guest professor. So there, there I am uh, once a year. Thank you. So now if you can just explain us uh, how you are teaching uh, occupational sciences in Karolinska Institute, mm -hmm. because it's something we are trying to do in French-speaking area. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you can tell, tell us about your experience mm -hmm. as an educator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I came to Karolinska uh, Institute uh, seven years ago uh, from uh, Japan. I was working clinically there. Um, and um, before that I had been a postdoc at KI mm -hmm. uh, and uh, did my education in the United States. So I did my occupational science degree at University of Southern California mm -hmm. uh, and my OT degree in, in Springfield in Massachusetts. Um, and during that process uh, I both was, I mean, had seen occupational therapy as a student um, and I had also taught uh, both in, in America and in, in Japan. Um, and when, when uh, I started here at Karolinska Institute, we were just in the process of sort of redoing our curriculum uh, mm -hmm. and re-evaluating re how we were teaching uh, and what we were teaching. And one of the things that, uh, that we talked a lot about in the course that I had responsibility for, which was the first semester course for the first year students <laughs> who, who sort of had chosen occupational therapy but maybe were not uh, fully aware yet of why they were going to become occupational therapists. Uh, many of them actually had a pretty good idea. But the courses at the time were, were a lot of um, lectures and seminars, workshops, um, and we, <clears throat> we talked about that how do you learn occupation? Um, maybe you need to experience uh, to some degree occupation mm -hmm. in order to understand um, the theory behind it. So uh, we re redid this course, uh, and um, the students in the first uh, uh, week of the program, uh, I asked them, um, please pick or select an occupation that you have never done before or that you haven't done for a very, very long time. And they say, well, how long is a very long time? Well, I mean, at least a few years, I used to say. And um, <clears throat> they were uh, then to uh, actually start doing this occupation. Uh, and we, to make it very concrete, uh, we said twice a week and uh, at least for enough time to experience mm -hmm. the occupation. Uh, and it could be open. It could be everything from yoga to uh, uh, cycling, um, making food, trying new types of recipes, mm -hmm. learning a language, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, at the, while students were doing this, uh, trying out this new occupation, they were simultaneously also reading the first third of the uh, model of human occupation, mm -hmm. which is uh, from occupational therapy literature, I would say. But it, I mean, the, the theory and the model uh, has a lot of things that uh, make the occupation central in, in, mm -hmm. in the model. And, and that, for that reason, mm -hmm. sort of becoming an occupational therapist, being able to use this model to understand the experience was, was it's important. It's based on occupation, uh, not necessarily only on occupational sciences. No. Mm -hmm. That's right. More broad than only occupational sciences. Because these, because these students are students becoming occupational therapists. Mm -hmm. But we want to have an occupational science thread, if you will, or a line through the, mm -hmm. through the curriculum. Uh, model of human occupation is something that they, the students often uh, feel is very concrete to wrap their brains around mm -hmm. to begin with. So they were reading uh, uh, the first third of the book, Model of Human Occupation while they are now also uh, actually uh, engaging in the mm -hmm. occupation that they've chosen. Um, and each week there are sort of uh, uh, a few articles from occupational science that are also inserted into mm -hmm. the curriculum. So they have uh, occupational therapy through MOHO, mm -hmm. 
they have experience of the occupation, mm-hmm. and then they have some OS literature um, from uh, early USC studies mostly. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> uh, also some from uh, Hans and, and uh, colleagues at, at KI actually. Um, and uh, while they're reading this, uh, we have seminars. So uh, each week is coupled with a seminar and the supervision in mm-hmm. small groups. And then the students uh, run a blog so that they uh, blog their experiences uh, online. And then they are in project groups, so they comment each other's blogs. Uh, and in these blogs, they have two parts. One is the experiential part of how it's going in their occupation. Mm-hmm. And the second is tying it to the theory that they're reading from mm-hmm. MOHO and from occupational science articles. So they have to make the links between what yes. they read and what they are doing. Yes. So for instance, uh, since <laughs> the assignment is uh, to choose an occupation that they've never done before or that they haven't done for a long time, mm-hmm. it means changing routines, changing habits. So in, in the model of an occupation, mm-hmm. These are the natural parts of the theory about habits and routines mm-hmm. and volition and so forth. So they can connect it to that. But in, in, uh, in the occupational science literature from, from occupational balance, for instance, uh, it, it impacts upon their balance when they become a student and they've changed to, uh, from work to mm-hmm. student life and then they are introducing something new in their, in, in the, and how the difficult it is to, to sort of maybe do something new mm-hmm. for many. Mm-hmm. Uh, for others, it gives more energy. And, and that sort of... Uh, dynamic is something that students can discuss with each other in the blogs and, and, mm-hmm. and then they can start thinking about what is it about doing something new that gives me energy or that for you makes you feel more tired for instance and so forth mm-hmm. so these are the kinds of things that we, we try to to build into the curriculum and so your question of how do we uh, teach occupational mm-hmm. science for us our students are uh, students in occupational therapy and what we think is uh, uh, fundamental is, is um, theory about occupation. Uh, and that is both something that needs to be tied to practice for the, for the com- becoming occupational therapist, but also from the, sort of the, the growing body of literature around uh, different aspects of occupation. And what we do is we, we have an experience-based curriculum in the beginning so that students who, instead of having to sit and read lots of books and articles about something very abstract, <laughs> We say, I mean, here's something very concrete. Try this out. Yeah. And they try it out and blog about it, discuss it, get supervision. And that is a way of sort of enriching or deepening. experience. Yeah. yeah. And what kind of article do you give to them? Uh, do you give them uh, basic articles or fundamental articles or more specific articles on some different concepts? Uh, both. So, I mean, uh, right now I'm not uh, longer course uh, responsible for this course. So it, of course, depends a little bit about who the instructor is uh, for the course, and it also depends on what's going on in the literature. Uh, but some of the some of the things we've had have been about occupational balance. Uh, some things have been about identities, uh, which is coming from the if you think about journal of occupational science literature. Um, and, and uh, identities. I mean, Christensen, uh, Rudman, myself uh, have sort of mm-hmm. written different aspects about this, um, and others, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so we, we tend to choose those kinds of articles, uh, but we also choose, um, uh, for instance, when uh, when Claire Hawking did uh, did sort of review of, of uh, the trends in, in the Journal of Occupational mm-hmm. Science, um, or uh, the recently uh, when. Uh, uh, Becky Aldrich and, and uh, um, I forget the, the middle of yeah Joy T. Gupta and uh, Debbie Rodman have, have sort of now done some sort of critique of the, the dissertations for instance in North America mm-hmm. those kinds of articles we also take up because it's interesting since it's a review of, of mm-hmm. uh, the field mm-hmm. um, and it, it, it's good material to raise a debate about what it is that we are um, and there are some debates between students about, uh, for instance, occupation and what is occupation for them or what is the meaning of what they are doing in this module. Mm. Yes, so mm. we, we try to build in um, this type of live uh, debate. Mm. Um, in, I would say in, in the first semester we don't have so many uh, formal debates, but it's rather in the seminar form where mm. students uh, represent different uh, perspectives and they need to discuss it. Okay. And so you told me it was like a thread, a line. Uh, and when uh, do you teach 
occupational sciences in itself at the moment during the cursus. Uh, with the specific authors, I am thinking about Jerkza or Ei or uh, yes, we talked about uh, Hawking or Wilcock. Is it something you are doing later for mm -hmm. in another year of the study? Uh, so occupational science in the first uh, the first course is called Fundamentals in Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. And there are different modules in the course. Mm -hmm. uh, one module is occupational science. Specifically. Yes, so. and that has to do with uh, choosing this occupation and analyzing it mm -hmm. from the perspective of these, this literature. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in later in the program, there are also modules of occupational science in um, uh, occupation and creativity course, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a module on occupational science. Um, what do you call uh, occupational creativity? Uh, occupation and creativity. And creativity, okay. Yeah, so, so in that course, students, <clears throat> they try uh, different modalities. It can be everything from textile to uh, movement, drama, uh, ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea being to, to experiment with different uh, aspects mm -hmm. of creativity. Um, and uh, there's a lot of literature around creativity and occupation uh, mm -hmm. in a way. But there we draw on other authors also outside of, of the core occupational science. For instance, Csikszentmihalyi mm -hmm. with flow theory. Yeah. Um, cool. uh, and then of course, uh, so that's in the middle, that's in the third semester. Uh, and then uh, towards fifth and sixth semester, uh, when students are working on their research projects, their bachelor thesis, um, this is again where, where the literature comes in because we are expecting that um, that all students in their bachelor thesis has some type of uh, grounding mm -hmm. in an occupational an occupational perspective, mm -hmm. but it does not have to be occupational science. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be if if you want to make the line between OS and OT, it can it can be more therapy focused in some and more uh, occupational science focused in others. It's a question uh, I would like to ask you mm -hmm. concretely because it's something uh, practitioners uh, ask us: What does occupational science? Uh, brings to occupational therapy. Mm. Mm. This is something really uh, like a miracle, something totally new, or it change or it legitimates uh, differently the job mm. of occupational therapy. It's, it's not easy to. <laughs> well, I mean, I uh, I'm not so um, um, I, I'm not uh, what should I say I'm I'm not so uh, preoccupied that 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 occupational therapy and occupational science have to be uh, have to be or should be different mm -hmm. or that we should have a divide I, I'm rather uh, I rather would would like us to see that we uh, see this as, as something that is uh, united mm -hmm. and I don't think of occupational science as being separate from occupational therapy in the sense that the ideas of occupational science comes from mm -hmm. scholars within occupational therapy so there's a very, very concrete birth of the ideas that later became occupational science yeah. in, in occupational therapy scholarship, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, <clears throat> but uh, on the other hand, if we look at some of the developments, uh, at least the way I see it, um, uh, then in, in North America, in the United States, when, when uh, occupational science uh, came forth and grew out of, of the movement at, at USC, mm -hmm. uh, that perhaps had more to do with sort of the emergence of a discipline uh, and, and needing to have an academic discipline for the practice profession of occupational therapy, but where the focus was still very much on the individual. Mm -hmm. And if we think about the Lifestyle Design Project which, uh, or study, which was uh, one of the sort of early flagships uh, where one had this occupational perspective, it was very much occupational therapists that were being trained to provide mm -hmm. this other type of intervention. And that for me is quite different than, than Alan Wilcock, uh, that around the same time in a different continent was talking about ideas on a population level and talking about sort of the, the biopsychosocial mm -hmm. mm -hmm. human as, as an evolutionary being, uh, you know, having been an occupational being by nature and that, that occupation was as, as necessary for life as food and water, if mm -hmm. you will. And, and Wilcock being more interested in, in sort of addressing these inequities in, in, on a population level and, mm -hmm. and, and having the right to be occupied. It's like the, the Australian way of thinking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
and I think that uh, the Canadians have, I mean, in, in Canada, the, the movement has, I think, also been similar to, to that of mm-hmm. Australian, maybe somewhere in, in between. But <clears throat> um, so, uh, so that being said, uh, if, if, if we think about sort of the, the literature, if we were to pick up uh, uh, the American Journal of Occupational Therapy or the Scandinavian Journal like, or the British Journal or, mm-hmm. or sort of any journal uh, that is, uh, has occupational therapy in it, uh, I think that the articles, uh, for the most part, tend to be a little bit different in nuance than the Journal mm-hmm. of Occupational Science. Uh, and and uh, what exactly is very difficult to say, uh, what is different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but my take on it is that, that Scandinavian Journal of Occupational Therapy and the Journal of Occupational Science are the other two journals that perhaps are most um, eager to accept articles that are in the in the genre of uh, what what usually is uh, keyworded occupational mm-hmm. science in, in some way. Um, and and your question uh, sort of was uh, what contribution does occupational mm-hmm. science exactly. make to occupational therapy? And I'm I'm making a long trip there because <sighs> because I don't want because I want to be clear that I, I don't mean that these should be separate or that there's a mm-hmm. tension between this. It's rather that they, they they are in a way united and they they could be uh, mm-hmm. always uh, giving uh, take giving and taking. It's it's a sort of um, well as Yerkes and Clark have talked called it a sort of symbiotic relationship. They call mm-hmm. it once upon a time. <clears throat> Uh, and, and I think that that for um, for practicing occupational therapists to have the language about what their unique contribution to the team is uh, uh, has to do with being able to ground it in, in both theory and evidence and mm-hmm. practice uh, I mean on all levels um, so understanding uh, understanding the sort of the, the dimensions of occupation uh, is is useful Mm-hmm. Both in terms of terminology, but also conceptual. Mm-hmm. So let us uh, take this abstract notion and, and make it concrete. If you if you think, what do what do people in the lab do when they study cells? They study a cell under a microscope and they, they describe it and identify it in mm-hmm. order to do other things. Well, that's also what we're in a way doing with occupation. We're studying it to to understand it's how how it works mm-hmm. yeah, for people. Um, and uh, for instance, one th- one contribution I would say uh, that has come from this movement of of, of occupational science is that that uh, in in the history of occupational therapy, uh, occupation has for the most part been perceived as something positive. It's something good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we provide more occupation or a better quality of it, then then things will be better. But in the critique of, of this uh, in, in, in occupational science, we've also seen that, well, I mean, a, an occupation can be both good and bad. Exactly. And, and it very much depends on, on, on not only on the individual, but also over time. So if I have a risk for stroke as a disease, for instance, mm-hmm. which is a very common disease and which is killing a lot of people every year, uh, then if we if we say that well if you only have sort of more healthy occupations then you have a better mm-hmm. chance of surviving or have less risk for stroke and then the question comes what's a better occupation right mm-hmm. and, and and i mean if we say that moving more physically is better well is it really better i don't know because it could be better if i'm very sedentary mm-hmm. it's it's complex it's, it's not complex uh, yeah. yeah so is it Maybe occupational science is uh, uh, make this complexity emerging. Mm. It's, occupation is not something good for the well-being of people. It can be mm-hmm. can be negative for them. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that that dimension of of that one and the same occupation, if you will, or what some people would call activity, mm-hmm. but when experienced by somebody, mm-hmm. it becomes an occupation. <coughs> uh, can can be both good and bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, on, on the one hand, it can be health demoting or, or bad for your health, and on the other aspect, it can be good for your health. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and it can be good for, for my health today, but tomorrow it might be bad for my health, even though I do this, and the same person does the same thing, yes. depending on... Uh, the time dimension it. also uh, yeah. is to be considered. Uh, and I think that, mm-hmm. that aspect sort of for clinicians is important to sort of, uh, I think, have this dialogue that, that when we study things in, 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 in the research realm, we're starting to 
critique these ideas, and that is what develops our clinical practice and how we use mm -hmm. uh, things. Yeah, for instance, it can be yes, to explore more why this kind of occupation could be healthy or positive for yeah. this person, considering his context, considering yeah. uh, his situation. Yeah. Can be something like that, yeah. a contribution like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because some critics, you tell me about critics, for instance, about individualism, some things it's, it is recurrent in the mm. literature about mm. occupational sciences. And one uh, another critic is about the different concepts that are used in the literature. And a lot of them, uh, many authors, uh, uh, say that they are lacking fundamental theories, they are lacking uh, evidence, they are lacking uh, a lot of things. and it's. I am thinking about Hamel, for instance, who is mm. <laughs> really mm. uh, harsh against this concept. Mm. Uh, what do you think about, for instance, occupational balance, occupational justice? That these are concepts we can read a lot now in literature, and on an, uh, another hand, we can read that yes, they are good concept, but without any consistency sometimes. Mm. And what do you think about it? Should we maybe? explore more these concepts before going through them or before using them in literature or is it something we can do in the, in the same time? I think we can do it in the same time. I mean if we don't have it out there to discuss mm. it's difficult to. So no, I think that it's it's good to have uh, mm. material out for dialogue um, in different ways, both in the academic forum verbally and in conferences and also in the written Mm. And maybe you can give some example uh, about clinical applications that mm. you and you know someone is doing with concept or with occupational sciences. Mm. Well, I mean, so in Sweden I don't work clinically uh, mm. right now, uh, but uh, just before moving here I was working in Japan. Uh, and then I had a, a position at the hospital and, and uh, we started there, it was in mental health uh, and, um, uh, and in Japan a lot of the, the policy has changed the last decade so that uh, less psychiatric beds mm -hmm. uh, should be available and, and more people should be living in the community and receiving their uh, psychiatric services in the community rather mm -hmm. than in the hospital uh, and, and occupational therapy has a very uh, clear or uh, yeah, obvious role mm -hmm. in that process and um, so uh, we, we <clears throat> but on the other hand uh, occupational therapists in, in Japan in, in the psychiatric setting have also worked very much in the medical paradigm and, and, and that sounds a bit strange to say a medical paradigm because what does that mean I mean everything is yeah, more or mm -hmm. less that but, um, but what I mean is that uh, working more on sort of uh, structured group therapy types of things in the institution, um, perhaps needing to relate to sort of medic medication management, uh, to routines set by uh, nursing staff and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, <clears throat> and what we did was, uh, uh, A, we started a, a network uh, up, uh, with um, the neighboring hospitals and clinics where there were occupational therapists interested in, in sort of discussing this occupational perspective. And then we started with uh, case studies, mm -hmm. so people brought case studies, uh, and in the beginning these tended to be very traditional. So they, they were being reported just like all the medical rounds, you know. Mm -hmm. So and so is uh, 60 years old and has this diagnosis, yes. or has been living here for X months, and, and that type of, uh, yeah. But that's what everybody knew, so that was comfortable to, to do mm -hmm. that. And then we started analyzing these cases and said, what if we were to shift the perspective and, and, and focus on, on the occupational mm -hmm. being? Uh, what if we were to shift and use the language of doing, being, and becoming, or mm -hmm. doing, being, belonging, and becoming, or, or becoming and belonging? <clears throat> um, and, and then we, we sort of started having another complexity to, to each case. And, and based on that, uh, uh, then some occupational therapists started to, to sort of change their practice um, within the reimbursement system that was, was there. Mm -hmm. So uh, combining group and individual sessions um, and um, making things much more sort of real life, if you will. Uh, so using the, the inner garden to, uh, this was a rural hospital. So a lot of people had 
quite a good connection with nature. Mm -hmm. um, but using mm -hmm. the inner garden to, to plant uh, things. And that meant that, that if you say the goal is to get cucumbers, well, what do we need to do to get cucumbers? Mm -hmm. And then the people have to sit down and plan it. And by planning, it means that we're using a variety of strategies to, to discuss, to plan, how are we going to plant it, who's going to buy it, how are we going to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, create a watering schedule, uh, what time of year is best for doing mm -hmm. this. It creates uh, sort of real it's life reflection. challenges, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, people went out to the community to buy the things, plant the things, water the plants, uh, sh uh, harvest the, the cucumbers, and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there's a very real outcome to this. So instead of sitting in a, in a traditional session and using some sort of paper and pencil task to work on problem solving, this was more engaging, mm -hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. because people had a, had a natural uh, background in the rural community and they understood the idea of farming and they understood the idea of, of um, that if I plant this seed, something will grow and I can actually eat it at the end of the day. And it required the, the group to problem solve and to make a plan and so forth. So the sense was different. <laughs> yes, so I would say that the, the clinical goal mm -hmm. was the same and, and the way that we worked was different. Uh, but it became a, a more clear progress and, and in the team to, to um, justify the perspective of why this is uh, uh, occupation or occupational therapy. How, why do people feel better or happier? Why are people more engaged? Uh, is this is something that you have measured at the end of the experience? Uh, the well-being or the how people, uh, how participants evaluated their mm. health? Actually, uh, when we did this project in Japan, we did not measure it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a purely a, a development project in the hospital, so it was not uh, research. Um, so you're right, uh, it may be that um, there's no evidence for that, but the, um, the staff, uh, particularly the nursing staff, um, were very uh, intrigued by the change that they experienced mm -hmm. amongst the persons who previously, for instance, uh, have not been engaged in coming out of their rooms, I mean, have been very isolated. They, they stay in their room, they say, come on, mm -hmm. come out to the, to the activity. No, I don't want to come out today, I will stay in my room, I, I don't want to. And seeing those people coming out and starting to engage in things, mm -hmm. that difference mm -hmm. uh, is observed difference. It's a clinical difference. Mm -hmm. It's something that people experience in the, in the room. The next step would have been to do maybe a project mm -hmm. to look at some sort of uh, different clinics and, and, and so forth. But, but the, that proves that it is worthy to do something like that to, to yeah. make studies, to explore yeah. with an occupational perspective this kind of, yeah. of thing. So the question is about leadership and, um, well, I mean, I, I think that um, leadership, actually I think that occupational therapists uh, uh, have a very good, um, what should I say, background for leadership. Mm -hmm. Because occupational therapists tend to be uh, good at observing, tend to be good at listening, and tend to be analytical in terms of identifying the challenge and solutions. So, I mean, those are uh, qualities mm -hmm. that perhaps are good. With that said, of course, it's it's not something you can generalize and say that everybody's good at that. But <clears throat> so, what am I thinking of this? I think that well, first, I guess it has to do with what, what is leadership, and and Another leadership. Question. Yeah, and leadership. Maybe I mean, leadership is not the same as administrative uh, chief or head mm -hmm. of something. It, 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 leadership. Uh, is perhaps uh, having to do with being a role model or uh, having to do with um, uh, knowing when to make a decision, uh, knowing when to uh, uh, say that the decision one took was wrong <laughs> and mm -hmm. to change the decision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of these things, I guess, are part of leadership. Uh, when we work with patients uh, in, in a clinical setting, <clears throat> I think that there's uh, leadership in the, in the perspective of uh, representing uh, the client mm -hmm. in a team meeting. Uh, it can have to do with leading other occupational therapists uh, and, and, of course, uh, working with uh, 
clinical education of mm -hmm. uh, students is, is uh, in a way for the clinical supervisor a, a matter of uh, showing leadership, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and the same thing is uh, true, of course, in research and, and in the academy, that there's uh, several levels of, of leadership that, mm -hmm. that we take in as course leaders or as, as uh, leaders in, in, in the profession. Um, and uh, then, then there's also the sort of the professional academic leadership in organizations and in, in sort of developing ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so based on my experience, yes, I think that there's lots of leadership in occupational therapy, and I think that uh, it, it's different. It takes a different form in research and education. Mm -hmm. Depending and on the fields you are. Yes, yeah. uh, and I think that uh, it's and I think it's very important that uh, more people uh, in occupational therapy uh, find it interesting with uh, taking leadership roles more formally uh, and representing uh, both the discipline and the profession in uh, a wide... I will leave it actually at, uh, at what I said because the, the leaders for me in occupational therapy are, are in the clinic, mm -hmm. in the everyday life uh, amongst uh, uh, students and Clients, patients, people, mm -hmm. uh, leaders in occupational therapy are, are um, uh, in the education system uh, who are uh, facilitating learning and leaders uh, in uh, research uh, are uh, leading the sort of development of, of uh, mm -hmm. filling knowledge gaps, if you will. and. Uh, and, and then, of course, there are the formal organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be patient organizations and can be uh, you know, special interest groups, community organizations, of course, professional organizations. And uh, the leaders in those organizations are also, of course, very important. So can be a group, not only one person. So yes, yeah, so I would, I wouldn't, I would, I would be hesitant to give one person and say mm -hmm. that this is this is a, a, an example of one leader because as soon as I say one person, uh, there are <laughs> so many other people mm -hmm. that I would think of. Uh, I think there are. I think there are many, many leaders in, 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 um, in occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's important that we have different leaders. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think diversity is, yeah. is important. Uh, so. and for instance, maybe just if you can uh, advise us to, to read about some authors from occupational sciences, uh, do you think we should start with someone or we should be aware of authors? Mm. If there are some specific authors we have to read, or to explore more, not to go back to at the beginning only with Yerza or Wilcock, and the, can I say, the old leader? Mm. Well, I mean, that can be done in different ways. Uh, I think that, um, uh, of course, I do think that the formal history, uh, by looking at uh, Yerza and Clark and uh, Zemke and Jackson and so forth, mm -hmm. Uh, and as well as Wilcock, and as well as Townsend and Paul Taiba and so forth, uh, are important persons to, to look at uh, mm -hmm. from the perspective of their contributions to, to the development of the science um, some decades back in time. Uh, but another interesting way of doing it is if, uh, and perhaps you can ask Hans about this, is, is that uh, if you think about what are the core qualities, what are the core uh, areas within the science of occupation that are of interest. And um, Hans has written an article uh, about Ernst Westerlund, uh, mm -hmm. the physician of occupation in Sweden. Uh, and he has made, he has written sort of an interesting analysis of that internationally we tend to think of uh, Meyer as a sort of a founding father of occupational mm -hmm. therapy. Um, but uh, Hans has found this um, physician of uh, of Sweden that uh, in the 1800s uh, had a, a clinic before Meyer, if yes. you will, uh, which uh, and his his whole point was his prescription wa was for people who were feeling uh, not well uh, was um, what he called activity, but what we would today call occupation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean that could be of an interest to look at uh, the history of uh, well in Switzerland or in. in uh, France or mm -hmm. in other countries, sort of, if you take the core qualities of what we call occupation today, I mean, in that country, where, 
is there anything earlier in the history uh, of people who... who the meaning of occupation should be different depending on the period maybe, has been, maybe, yeah. could be, more than should be. Yeah, so a historical perspective could be interesting also to look at. Um, but no, otherwise I think that the, the general principle for me is that depending on what the question is and what the what the knowledge gap is. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're researching something, what what um, what knowledge are you seeking? Uh, then uh, what theories you need to mm -hmm. to back that up uh, means going back to the. That is, of course, what you would do. But so, so that would be more important than saying that there's one particular person one should read. Uh, I would say that it would probably be several people. Okay. Good.